Um, we are thrilled to get this series started this week um, with Susan Cohen, um, who's going to be talking about learning from narratives, how developing the pitch stimulates learning and new ventures. And um, we're thrilled also to have our discussant, Violina Rindova. So the way this is gonna work is Susan's gonna present for 25 minutes. If you have clarifying questions, please feel free to interrupt, uh, unmute yourself and speak or type um, in the chat and I will interrupt for you. Um, uh, following Susan's presentation, Violina will give a 10 minute discussion and then we'll open it up for a um, more broad Q&A. So if you have a question or suggestion that's not clarifying, feel free to type it in the chat at any time or um, bring it up during the, the Q&A period. All right, Susan, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. It's so nice to see so many um, familiar faces in the room and um, also some new ones. So it's really wonderful. Let me just get everything going here. I know I have this fancy way of presenting. I hope you like it. I learned it from Rem Koenig and I like it, so I stole it from him. So um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much to Liz, to Robin, SMS, and um, to Colleen. And apologies in advance to Violina for some last minute changes and updates. This is a obviously a work in progress, and so the paper is still in development. So um, it, it is the last of a series of papers for my dissertation, where I did a lot of inductive research and field work on accelerator programs. So I look forward to sharing it with you today. I'm pretty good at pausing for questions. And so I will try to pause periodically in case you have a question as we go through. And hold on one second, I forgot how to advance the slides. Just clearly an important thing to be able to do. Hang on one second. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I haven't done this for a while. There we go. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so we're all good now. Um, so I'd like to talk first start by sharing some research and some thoughts about ven new ventures. So new ventures need to learn to formulate their entrepreneurial strategies. And by an entrepreneurial strategy, I'm talking about the set of interdependent activities that a venture uses or anticipates using to create and capture value. There are many different elements of an entrepreneurial strategy, including the firm's value proposition, its target customer groups, its customer channels, relationships, partners, key activities, the resources that they need, the revenue model that they're going to um, employ, their hiring strategy, and so on. Some of these are captured by the business model canvas picture here, um, but there's other elements of entrepreneurial strategy um, beyond just what's on the business model canvas. Uh, but not only are there many elements of an entrepreneurial strategy, but each element needs to align with the venture's overall strategy. So not only do firms need to learn about each element, but then they also have to go through this alignment process and trying to understand the big picture. How is it that the whole strategy, the comprehensive strategy, how is that going to create and capture value for the firm? The firms seldom have a comprehensive, comprehensive strategy at the time of founding, of course, instead they learn, they adapt their strategies through a series of decisions and pivots um, or course corrections. So I see Jack's here in the audience today. Um, these decisions and pivots can go be very, very small as Jack's research finds, or they can be larger as typically is discussed in the entrepreneurship practitioner literatures. So the result is that ventures evolve their strategies over time as a result of learning. Huh. And so research has uncovered a very broad member menu of organizational learning processes. I'm not, I don't have time to go into each of these here today. I do so in more detail in the paper, but I broadly categorize the different forms of learning as learning from doing, which includes purposeful experimentation and trial and error learning, learning from borrowing, which includes vicarious observation and consultation, and learning from thinking, which includes mental models, analogies, metaphors, and anticipatory learning. Although research suggests that 
entrepreneurs engaged in several forms of learning, there's little research examining how entrepreneurs manage this repertoire of learning processes. And moreover, the role of pitching has largely been absent from studies of entrepreneurial learning. That is, we don't yet know if ventures can learn by pitching, or if they do so, we don't know anything about how they learn from pitching. Um, what do we know about pitching? Well, most prior working, work on pitching has begun with venture founders, like the one you see here in the middle, um, delivering a pitch. It's what I call a pitch event. Research then traces forward to determine which pitches or pitchers receive funding. At a very high level, this work has suggested that founders establish legitimacy by using rhetoric, gestures, displaying passion, or if you're lucky, being an attractive man. But since nearly all work on pitching begins with the founder delivering pitch and then ends with some sort of investors or evaluators evaluating that pitch, we know much less about this period on the left. That is, we know much less about the period leading up to the pitch event. Prior work has em emphasized the pitch as a static transmission or sometimes um, researchers have called it a sense giving device. But it's always been static. Researchers examine one iteration of the pitch and then trace it forward. There's a really important exception that I want to note that is Clinging Smith and Shane. They run an experiment at a university pitch competition and they provide pitch content and style training videos to some groups of student entrepreneurs right before they go on stage. So about 20 minutes before they deliver their pitch. And this, this research shows that pitch training can improve pitch evaluation, mostly by increasing the number of strategy elements that are included in the pitch. And so the authors can't rule out that pitch training improves the underlying idea, but the training's only provided a few minutes, less than an hour before the pitch event. And so any changes to the underlying venture are very likely limited. So what's curious is what's not been the focus of prior research on pitching is how a venture may learn to improve the underlying quality of their venture idea. Learning can reduce uncertainty and the likelihood of needing to make future changes that are um, take future changes to the information contained in the pitch. That is, researchers have not yet considered how the process by which a pitch is developed might influence its entrepreneurial strategy. So my research questions. So since the learning literature largely emits pitching and the pitching literature largely emits learning, the questions of how ventures develop a pitch or how doing so might inspire entrepreneurial thinking, um, learning have fallen outside the scope of both streams of literature. So I asked how do firms use an evolving pitch to learn and how do firms learn to pitch? And so, I've been thinking a lot about what is pitching a case of, and so thinking about the bigger theory here. And so more generally, if we think of the pitch as a case of a narrative, then I'm also exploring how might firms use narratives to learn. So this would be the bigger picture research question tying in. I do want to pause here and check the chat, and I just did, and I don't see anything. But if anybody has any questions before I move into my methods, I'll, I'll wait here a second. Okay. So the current study is a part of a larger research program on accelerator programs and the entrepreneurial ventures that participate in them. The data collection was part of my dissertation and it began with a really broad research question of how do entrepreneurial firms learn while in an accelerator. During field work, pitching emerged as a key activity and one that facilitated many different types of learning. So I didn't set out to study pitching, it surfaced while in the field. This observation was striking because it's drastically deviated from what the way extant literature had depicted the role of the pitch as a transmission device. Um, so I refocused my study on the surprise and my, mostly I refocused my analysis on the surprise. So not surprisingly, my research setting is accelerator programs, which are limited duration cohort based entrepreneurial programs for nascent ventures. So that, um, unlike other entrepreneurial training programs, they don't not accept individuals and provide general entrepreneurship education. They're really focused on advancing a nascent venture and a venture team. 
it's an ideal study for studying the relationships, excuse me, there's a, it's an ideal setting for studying the relationship between pitch development and learning because they provide an observation window to very early students ventures who are working on their pitch, working on their pitch as a core and a key activity for ventures inside of an accelerator program. Also, accelerated programs are often highly structured, which provides methodological advantages. It made it easier to triangulate and to use temporal bracketing to understand what was going on throughout these three month programs. Finally, because a primary focus of accelerators is helping participated, participating ventures both learn their strategies and prepare the pitches, I could observe the interaction between these two. Programs typically end with a grand finale, which they call demo day, where each entrepreneurial venture gets on stage and pitches to a large audience of investors and other, um, and other stakeholders. Uh, my head's a little bit in the way of this quote, but it says, let's see if I can go back. Um, so really quickly going over um, my sample and data analysis is a theoretically motivated sample. I looked for accelerators across the United States, although I have also traveled to a couple other continents and several other countries and visited accelerators. I'm not formally part of the study, but I have seen whether or not these ideas generalize through um, personal travel. I, I sampled both East, West, and Midwest um, regions of the United States, and then I looked for accelerator programs that were small, medium, and large. Um, I, within each accelerator, I then sampled startups that seemed like they were making more progress and samples that seemed like they were making less. This rarely was correlated with eventual outcomes uh, because these startups are so, so early. So they're on average 16 months from the time they had an idea. You, uh, quite often, they're, they're months away from when they actually incorporated and they're very very small they're typically 2.2 founders and around 85 percent have zero employees um 75 percent are all male teams and the average age of a founder was 31. i compiled multiple data sources and i analyzed the data using the joya method so in the paper, I show um, with more detail, but how the sample venture developed their pitches and their entrepreneurial strategies simultaneously. That is in contrast to prior work, which has mostly examined the pitch as an event occurring at a single point in time, and they separately examined learning to form entrepreneurial strategy that's contained in the pitch. My informants re repetitively describe pitch development as a process that was very much steeped in learning and very, very tightly tied to learning for strategy formation. So when I asked founders when they started preparing their pitch for demo day, the answer I heard most often was something along the lines of at the very beginning of the accelerator program. So what was striking to me about starting pitch development so early is that many of these ventures had not yet committed to a specific product or even a specific market. Some went into accelerator programs um, having only batted around a couple ideas, and most did not have critical elements of their entrepreneurial strategies formed. That is, they didn't yet determine how they would create or capture value. Going back to that business model canvas, it was all pretty much in flux. So how could they be working on their pitch before they actually knew what they were going to pitch? This seems very curious to me. So this is a this, this is part of the Joya model. It's really hard to include a Joya model on a presentation, as you qualitative researchers probably know. And so I picked four elements of the model um, to include here, and the, these focus on how entrepreneurs used the pitch to learn. Um, so it has four different. Um, aggregate dimensions here, and I'm going to expand on the two on the left side, draft a pitch and gather feedback. Um, the other two elements, which I don't go into as much detail on, are gathering advice, which is more forward looking and making progress to show progress. So let me provide a little bit of of context or a little bit of richness from the, the data on this idea of drafting a pitch. 
So programs began by asking ventures to direct, prepare their pitch and draft pitches for short, verbal elevator pitches, which were often under two minutes. Ventures had to identify the most important parts of their strategies to include, and they couldn't ramble because it was so short. They usually included some elements of their strategy in their pitch. I call this draft the pitch and I define it as creating a temporary verbal summary of the venture's plan for creating and capturing value. Venture founders also found it, venture founders often found it surprisingly difficult to express their embryonic venture ideas distinctly. Drafting a pitch triggered learning by thinking and comprises the second order codes understand and envision. When ventures turned internally, they sought to understand who they were. They also sought to understand what key strengths they had, and this provided the foundation of their entrepreneurial strategy. Quite often when they had decisions to make, they made it based on what their entrepreneurial teams could bring to the table. But they also had to craft a vision for the future. They had to just think about and, and understand where did they plan to take their company? Where was it that they wanted to go? The print, pitching that's prompted ventures to fuse the past, what they've done and who they are, with the future, where they wanted to go, by thinking not only about the key strengths that they already possess, but also how they would use those strengths to build a successful future. Because these activities relied on learning, they affected the firm's behavior. So one of the uh, managing directors explained to me that there's a lot of things that founders inherently understand about their business, but they don't realize that the rest of the world doesn't know. And so we start to realize that you have to explain how the pieces fit together. This takes time and is hard. And so our founders repeatedly express this idea of knowing more than they can say. They felt they understood their firms, but when they tried to articulate it and articulate it succinctly, they just couldn't do it. So their understanding was usually not quite as solid as they had originally thought it was. So drafting a pitch stimulated venture, ventures to learn because it stimulated them to think more deeply about who they are and where they wanted to go. This process of transforming general ideas into convincing and succinct narratives was way more challenging than they expected. It reduced their overconfidence, which was really valuable in their learning processes. Many recalled struggling to put into words what they felt they knew in order to convey their visions more convincingly. Founders frequently needed to reflect and really thought deeply as they struggled. As a result, they began, began to see where their own understanding was unclear and where additional learning could help pinpoint the sources of value creation and capture. This exercise triggered additional learning in which ventures focused on crystallizing their entrepreneurial strategy and became very clear eventually to themselves and ultimately transferable to others. Next, ventures use the pitch, and their developing pitch, their draft, as a stimulus to experiment with strategy alternatives. They collected feedback on their pitch strategy from multiple stakeholders like mentors, accelerator directors, and peers. And this feedback was on the pitch strategy which included what the firm had done and what it planned to do. The second order co concepts experiment, assess value, viability and progress formed this dimension. Given that pitches succinctly summarize a venture's current entrepreneurial strategy, pitching served as an efficient vehicle for collecting external feedback from the strategies. For instance, one founder explained how he used pitch development to gather feedback, and another founder explained, um, and I quote, you would basically pitch what your idea was, and if you had something to show for it, you would show your demo or, or the concept or whatever. In an ideal world, you would be getting as much feedback as possible, getting their thoughts, getting an understanding of why they don't understand something or why they think something won't work or if they think something else is a better idea. So I'm going to illustrate this using a little mini case. And so, um, here is what I'm calling Travelco in order to disguise the company's real name, name, and here is what their website looked like initially. And we can infer their strategy from what we see here, which corresponds perfectly to what the founder told me. Their initial plan was to sell excursion tickets directly to consumer tourist activities like zip lining, museum tours, and all the other things that you would do once you arrive at your destination 
destination. And hopefully we're all traveling soon and getting to go on excursions like zip lining soon, right? We're all hoping to do that. And so um, the initial customer feedback was really fantastic. The customer loved the idea and they signed up and no problem converting customers. They pitched their strategy to mentors. They told, they told mentors how they were going to sell excursion tickets directly to consumers through their website. And they plan to build a consumer travel brand to reach customers. The mentor feedback was really con consistent. Many, many different mentors told them it was going to take many millions of dollars to build a consumer travel brand. From drafting their pitch, the team knew that branding was not one of its core areas of expertise. These were hardcore travelers and travel insight is what they knew best. The founder told me, we realized, well, there's no way this is going to work. And the team went through a lot of different things. Unfortunately, it turned out not, okay, here's how you fix your current strategy, it's here's how you throw it out and do something else. And so what did they do instead? So the team searched for other um, distribution channels to reach the customers that they knew from their minimal viable product. They knew customers liked the general idea. They eventually learned from a mentor that they could sell to existing travel firms instead of selling direct to consumers. When they conducted con customer discovery interviews with firms in the travel industry, firms like airlines and hotels, they were asked for contracts on the spot. They pivoted very quickly to sell travel add-ons through an API to travel companies and updated their pitch to reflect the pivot. By selling through existing travel companies rather than selling directly to consumers, the venture learned it could capture more value from its products. So it was through pitching that the firm figured out that A, first of all, what its problem was, and then eventually through um, gathering feedback from mentors, they learned how to pivot and then validated that pivot through customer interviews. So gathering feedback stimulates Spencer's to learn because it, the pitch functions as a stimulus or a probe, which helps ventures retrieve relevant feedback from ventures advisors. Much as happens with ventures share minimum viable products with customers. So MVPs are a really great way to test products with customers, but a pitch is a great way to test business models and strategies with mentors. Um, and so a pitch, is also more easily adaptable than an MVP. And because of this adaptivity, ad easily adaptive feature of it, right? It's really cheap, cheap to change your words. Um, it meant that, that founders and ventures could, could test many different things. And some of them tested up to hundreds of different of iterations over the cost of the program. So the ventures le can learn from identical um, learn from advisors during pitch development. Excuse me, sorry, let me reset for a second. Returning to the example of the travel venture, customers wanted the, their products, but the venture learned from advisors during while it pitched that building a travel brand was going to be risky and expensive. So by selling through existing travel companies, so changing their business model, changing their distribution channel, it could capture more value from its product at lower risk. So gathering feedback can improve ventures entrepreneurial strategies, but it also can increase the clarity that entrepreneurs use to explain their ideas. So unfortunately, I can't go into much detail for um, all of the different um, aspects and, and um, themes that I was able to uncover, but let's step back for a moment and looking at a model. So look, examining, by examining how ventures pitch to learn and learn to pitch in a single study, I developed an iterative process by which ventures engage in multiple modes of learning. The model explicates how learning from narratives, in this case, a pitch or to potential investors can stimulate ventures to learn about and iterate improvements to their entrepreneurial strategies. What's key in this model are the arrows. Pitching triggers ventures to engage in multiple formats of learning. For example, drafting a pitch requires ventures to think deeply about their core strengths and points of differentiation. Gathering feedback using, using a pitch solicits input from external stakeholders, which improves the amount of value captured from these mentor consultations. Finally, something I did not discuss today, but gathering feedback on a pitch from external mentors helps ventures see their gaps in their knowledge and their progress. Embracing these gaps motivated multiple forms of learning and 
including learning by doing. For example, first firms started implementing their plans to make progress so they can discuss that progress in their pitch. This progress was sometimes product development and sometimes customer development. So while I focused here today on pitching to learn, the ventures in my study also learned to pitch. One of the most surprising thing to me was the sheer number of pitch repetitions founders reported, from a couple dozen to several hundred iterations. At the beginning, iterations would reflect significant learning, like shifting from being a direct-to-consumer company to a B2B company. As the firm settled its key strategy, changes would become more uh, incremental and eventually focused on delivery, things like gestures and word cho choices, even jokes. And I have a future research on cues and humor and pitches. I can't wait to share it with you. The process of learning to pitch mimicked in many ways the process of pitching to learn. Eventually, the pitch firms participated in the pitch event or demo day. This is where prior research starts. And so I hope my research is showing that current research is missing quite a lot of activity. So I want to just, as sort of an interesting aside, as I was putting my slides together today, this is one of the insights that I noticed. So when you're pitching to learn, knowledge confidence starts really high. These entrepreneurs had just got into a top accelerator program and they were pretty cocky. After, a while, after getting feedback on their knowledge, their confidence level would, would, would lower and they realized they actually had a lot to learn and then they would actually learn and the confidence would move back up. However, learning to pitch worked exactly the other way. So presentation confidence was really low initially. They knew they stunk at pitching, but then eventually these hundreds of iterations increased their confidence. And so these confidence was actually moving in different directions, which I thought was kind of interesting and it's an idea I might expand on a little bit further. So my final slide, if I look at contributions, first I contributed to the entrepreneurship literature and shifting the focus on pitching. Our work has really focused on the pitch of a static event and the period of a pitch event to funding. And so I'm shifting scholarly attention to the period before the pitch event and altering the conceptualization of a pitch from something that's static to something that's dynamic. Shedding new light on the importance of pitching and shaping a venture's entrepreneurial strategy. I also add to this body of work showing how the pitch can be used for testing. So similar to how an MVP is used to gather feedback on customers, the developing pitch functions as a flexible, flexible blueprint that gathers feedback from external stakeholders. But unlike an MVP, pitching facilitates learning on multiple elements of entrepreneurial strategy, as well as how those elements are configured into an integrated whole. Also, because it's so easily adaptable, ventures can test hundreds of iterations of their strategies. What's pitching a case of? Well, I'm going to argue it's a type of narrative, although I'm not, I'll admit that I'm not certain about this. My research shows how narratives can be used not only to make sense of the past or communicate visions of the future, but also to influence the underlying strategies and stories. I introduce a new type of narrative, a learning narrative and associated process model that shows how these nar narratives scaffold learning through multiple processes. And then finally, I can contribute to the learning literature. A key challenge for entrepreneurial firms is managing a repertoire of learning processes and then storing what they learn. Learning narratives, like a pitch, can help new ventures navigate multiple forms of learning. And one day, way they do so, so is by prompting feedback that exposes internal knowledge gaps and future aspirational gaps, which also trigger learning. So more broadly, this research suggests that narratives can be used to facilitate learning about complex systems with critical interactions between multiple elements. And so I thank you very, very, very much. I'm so grateful for your being here today. And I look forward to hearing Violina's comments and your questions. And I do hope that you share your questions with us at the end. Thank you so much, Susan, that was great. Um, so Violina, you have 10 minutes. Absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this session. It was an absolute pleasure to read Susan's paper, and it's a great pleasure to be able to share some reflections on how she addressed a really important question in entrepreneurship research, which is the development of entrepreneurial strategy, which, as her pa paper elegantly shows, is really getting a lot more attention recently uh, in terms of thinking about the issues around uncertainty, um, and doing so by focusing on a widely observed but under-theorized phenomenon, namely pitching. And that last point actually brings me to starting my comments 
with an image. If I may have the next slide, please. And this is an image of a Zen calligraphy. I don't know exactly what this calligraphy repre represents, but the general category of art really um, speaks to the possibility of looking with new eyes, uh, looking at things that surround us, at the world around us uh, with uh, fresh new insights in, and doing that um, in a way that stimulates a lot of new meaning making. And these are some of the strengths of this paper. There is a lot to like um, about this paper. And I just wanted to emphasize this gestalt about looking at something that is hidden in plain sight. We all know how common and pervasive it is and giving it a new conceptualization. So on my next slide, please, um, I highlight that this paper develop, delivers really fundamental, no, fundamentally novel insights by essentially reconceptualizing uh, the pitch, um, and I have it here in quotation marks because the paper actually shows very clearly that what we thought to be the pitch is actually can be thought in different ways, um, moving kind of away from the emphasis on the, uh, it as a being a persuasive act, a single event, into a learning process. So you can see here the sort of dual reconceptualization of both the phenomenon in terms of duration and what it entails, as when as well as the theoretical lens that um, she applies to think about that phenomenon, and that um, meets more than meets the bar for what Murray in his um, you know iconic article and what's interesting um, described as an interesting proposition is a negation of an accepted one, and I think this paper does really an outstanding job of um, changing our perspectives on this commonly observed phenomenon. What I would like to focus my comments on a little bit is on the possibility of a dialectical theorization of this um, do, you know, tension between persuasion and learning, um, and maybe how taking a further dive in um, the rich observations that um, Susan already shared with you, and there are more of them in the paper, can help think about these um, you know, oppositional terms like pitching slash persuading and learning as being very different, as well as communicating and strategizing. I would say that both of these have been of interest to strategy scholars, especially in the context of novelty, uncertainty, and entrepreneurial strategies for a long time. And this paper um, has the richness of the data and some already um, important critical insights in place to take us in new directions on this. So next slide, please. Um, I'm going to highlight three opportunities for further exploration and theory development. And I don't mean that these should be addressed in this paper, which already has a lot of uh, depth and insight, but maybe um, as adjacent areas for further exploration by Susan, collaborators, or people in the audience. Uh, and these three areas are thinking about the pitch as a designed narrative artifact, keeping with the idea of what is the pitch a case of, it's a, what kind of narrative it might be. Uh, the role of different thinking modes that may be involved in the development of the pitch, as well as um, thinking about this entire process that um, Susan Paper captures as a collective sense-making process and what that means for developing novel strategy and our business models. So I'll take a quick look at each of these uh, on my next slide, um, please. Um, I'm going to start with thinking about the pitch as a design narrative. I've been writing a lot more on design and narratives nowadays, so I admit that this framing uh, reflects some of my, you know, the salience of what I have, uh, have been working on. But in reading the paper and in the presentation you saw, you know, the example of the business model campus, one question that um, arises is to what extent the development of pitches follows an institutional template? And I think that's an empirical question that Susan is, an, is in an incredibly good position to address because she has the opportunity to look at this um, across um, multiple iterations as well as across multiple uh, startups. Uh, to what extent developing the pitch is a creative design act, right? What, might, what does that look like in putting together um, this particular artifact? And the paper has many insights about how you know, in many ways, they start with uh, not a lot of preconceived notions about strategy or even the pitch, what the pitch itself uh, need be. 
And then the idea of a design artifact as an evolving epistemic object, right? That's kind of the learning narrative in which that actually is part of a stakeholder, stakeholder dialogue. So let me uh, move quickly into each, um, into the next one, which focuses uh, on the next slide on the extent to which the processes of design, developing the, the pitch, learning, process, receiving feedback, and incorporating that feedback in the next iteration of the pitch and the strategy involves different kinds of thinking. So when we think about narratives as a field, I think it is really important to um, kind of go to some fundamentals that uh, Jerome Bruner outlined in his uh, very early uh, work on um, narrative, the narrative as a distinct cognitive mode of thinking, where he actually contrasts the logical scientific mode that has become so central to understanding experimentation. And Susan Paper does a great job of looking at the studies who have done that, which essentially relies on procedures, repeatable procedures to ensure verifiable references in a, oriented toward gaining true insights into the marketplace. Narrative, the narrative cognitive mode actually um, really engages with the world in a different way. It focuses on the individual, the singular, the particular, the notions of identity that Susan highlighted and uses kind of develops these believable, believable sequences that blend the subjective and the objective. Um, Jerome Bruner calls these dual landscapes, specifically to speak to the ability of narrative to represent both kind of a notion of a reality and uh, the subjective viewpoint on this uh, reality. I think there is a growing body of work that looks at strategy as theories, the strategy is being developed from a value rational perspective, uh, kind of a subjectivist view, all of which speak to um, combining what we have traditionally thought of as uh, the analytical mode with this more narrative personal mode. And this mode is particularly important when entrepreneurs seek to connect the past, present and future. So again, the data is super rich and there are opportunities, I think, to begin to tease this apart, especially over time. We will learn a lot more about how entrepreneurs learn if we um, are able to map changes in these different modes of thinking in terms of origination versus legitimation and learning from the ecosystem. Which brings me to my third point, uh, which is uh, uh, on the next slide. The model that I saw in Susan's paper really speaks to um, a collective uh, process of sense making. It is initiated, right? It is triggered by the pitch, but there is quite a bit of engagement by a variety of actors. I'm not going to spend much time on this because obviously this could be a paper in its own right, but I'm simply going to highlight one thing that I have observed in my own work on the development of entrepreneurial strategies is that entrepreneurs face tremendous heterogeneity in seeking feedback. There's heterogeneity of preferences, of knowledge and therefore quality of inputs, as well as the relationship that different actors are interested in establishing with the venture, both from a structural and from a personal point of view, right? Founder networks versus kind of exchange networks. So if one were to map that process in a systematic way, I think there are different pathways that may be, and again, Susan is in a much better position than me to know the answer of this question, that may be, um, provide different types of patterns of feedback. And that would be also interesting in terms of understanding learning patterns. Next slide, please. The model that Susan um, shared with us is really a terrific accomplishment in terms of documenting specific activities that speak to the development of the pitch, of the sharing and receiving of feedback from these different audiences, as well as coming back to the notion of the venture strategy. So uh, one thing, and, and what Susan does very effectively, is shows how the different um, modes of learning identified in prior research map on these activities. 
as someone who has always worked on the intersection of strategy and entrepreneurship, for me, what was very interesting is how do these come together? How do founders reintegrate sense making and sense giving? How do they bring this feedback right into the change strategy bullet point in the making progress in developing new strategy? And how do they balance the disclosure involved in these communications to receive feedback with protecting information asymmetries, which have been kind of has been a central question of interest to strategy scholars. Empirically, what this asks for is how does the degree of over overlap between strategy and communication may change over time? So uh, I'm probably at the end of my time and maybe a little over it. So I'm just going to uh, provide a quick conclusion slide uh, that overall the paper offers really a novel framework for understanding entrepreneurial strategy as a set of communicative and learning processes by centering on the pitch. Um, it looks as pitching as a process of what I kind of, again, from the perspective of the work that I have done, is a form of interactive agency that combines different skills around design persuasion and learning. And there is a lot to unpack um, here. And several of the processes she identifies in this, um, in the context of entrepreneurial strategy, I think are of high relevance to the question of developing strategy under uncertainty, which speaks not only to the entrepreneurship research community, but to the strategy research community as well. My final thought, was, which is where I started, um, that I would like to leave you with on the next slide, is that um, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and uh, Susan's paper exemplifies that because, um, as you saw in the presentation, she starts with a very simple observation and provides a novel con uh, conceptualization of a central question in both strategy and entrepreneurship research. So thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts on really on this really delightful paper. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful for those questions, for those comments and insight. And it, it's just really um, heartwarming that you've spent so much time at really gave my paper so much thought. So I'm very, very grateful. And I wish I was here in person, I could. Um, but it's really, really wonderful to, 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 and I appreciate that that insight. One, one of the things I wanted to ask you, because you really brought up um, something that I've been struggling with, which was the relationship between learning and sense-making. And so one of the things that I have been struggling with is I'm a learning scholar, um, but this, but pitching often has been put into the literature and with sense giving and sense making. And so trying to manage these different literatures. Do you have any insight? It's a great question. And you can think about some of this as kind of different research communities that have drawn on different literatures and with different terminologies. I think the sense making and sense giving framework um, leverages more strongly the ambiguity of meaning and the pluralism of meaning. So one part of sense making is entertaining different meanings, right? Almost like fitting different type of um, frameworks um, and vetting them in a, more, a lot more exploratory and creative format. Whereas I think the learning model is a lot more consistent with you know, the logical deductive, um, you know, there is a truth to be discovered and there is correct and incorrect learning, right? So whereas the sense making is there is a reality to be sense made of and you can configure it, it's closer, I would say, to the narrative mode. Um, I would say that there are more people who are working in sense making, sense giving and cross to the narrative side than um, people who work on the learning side and across the you know, into the narrative side, which I had in my comments that I think the notion of learning narratives is a little bit of a paradoxical uh, concept. And I think in my comment about uh, tracking the two uh, different modes of cognition can give you an empirical grounding um, to do something that I don't think many people have done for the reasons um, that I outlined earlier, that kind of there, these are somewhat different paradigms about what, what reality is and how it could be known. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, so we have some time for um, Q&A. That was amazing, Violina, thank you. Um, I'm gonna get it started since I don't see any hands up uh, yet. 
Um, so Susan, I wanted to build on um, something Velina said about, um, you know, kind of getting at there's like this value to learning, but the goal of the pitch is also, of course, to get people interested and to demonstrate competence. Um, and so I wonder, like, if you can say anything about at what point in the like pitch development process, um, is it okay to go out and kind of learn, um, but also legitimize? And at what point is it kind of like too risky? And is this something they also um, kind of have to learn about? I guess this like tension between yeah, actually uh, getting interest versus um, learning about their idea. Yeah, that's a really good question. Thank you, Liz. And in fact, in the paper, I talk a little bit more about this paradox because in order to establish legitimacy, ventures need to communicate a sense of, we know what we're doing, this is our plan, right? But at the same time, if they pitch a certain plan, they're entering into a social contract with investors and then they're they're tied to that pitch and it becomes to that that strategy. And as McDonald um, Worry and Chang's work shows, it can be really difficult to pivot later, right? So after you've secured funding, it becomes even more difficult to change your strategy later. And so what I'm what I'm seeing is that the entrepreneurs that really use their pitch to learn early on and advance and make those pivots earlier are actually in a much stronger position later when they secure external financing because you know i would theorize i don't have the data to show this but i would theorize that they then get the investors who buy into their real strategy right so for example if they're going to pivot from being a business to consumer to a business to business they should actually get an investor who wants to invest in business to business businesses and so um, they, they need to have fewer large pivots later and so one of the advantages of the context of an accelerator is this acceptance for learning and this um, many of the different accelerator managing directors started these programs because they wanted to have a bigger difference divert biggest the, the ability to have an impact and help ventures form formulate their strategies. So they want to help them pivot and adapt. And I think mentors have that same mentality and I think it's become more acceptable for entrepreneurs or even encouraged um, for entrepreneurs to make these really early pivots. And remember, these are two people, maybe two and a half people, right? No employees, these are super, super early. So I think it's very acceptable for entrepreneurs at that stage to pivot. Yeah, I think that's an interesting boundary condition too for the like, setting your studying. Um, yeah, that's awesome. As right, you wouldn't want necessarily, you know, a, a venture as it's starting to scale, it becomes much yeah. more difficult to pivot. Yeah, yeah. Esther, go ahead. Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for sharing this wonderful paper today. I, I loved it. Um, so my question is, uh, is more about trying to understand uh, uh, how uh, learning um, to pitch um, contributes to um, to the different type of learnings. Okay, so how do the different type of learnings happen in practice? And I can see um, intuitively how learning by thinking occurs. Uh, I was interested in uh, learning by borrowing and and learning by doing. And and yeah. also, uh, if they learn from different people, so if this learning uh, uh, occurs because they receive a feedback. If you can map the type, you know, the, the person who gives the feedback to the type of learning. Absolutely. And so um, that's, I, I went into that much less here. And to be honest, I'm still developing um, this part of the paper at the request of some reviewers because the paper it, um, has an R&R. &R. And so what, I, what I'm starting to see is that um, they, they are receiving feedback, a lot of feedback, feedback on words, choices, gestures, pacing, tempo, you know, all sorts of the types of things that prior research has uncovered as being important for pitch delivery, for appearing preparedness or appearing legitimate, right? So, but how do they know how to do that through this repetitive practice? And so the, the way they're borrowing is these more experienced entrepreneurs and investors are sharing their expertise with these 
uh, entrepreneurs and telling them, oh no, Esther, you should you should stand with your, you know, you should stand open. You should use more simple words that are approachable. You should you know, use greater gestures. You know, don't tell that joke. It's not funny. Tell this joke, it's funnier. And then the doing is actually pitching, right? So the doing is learning by doing. The doing is by pitching over and over and over again. And so it is interesting to think about the pitching being the doing, but um, I do believe that's what they are doing is learning through practice. So thank you very much. Esteem. Hey, Susan, um, really, really enjoyed that. Um, I guess, uh, and, and take this as a comment with a grain of salt, because obviously it's not really my area. I mean, I, you know, you start talking about cognition and my eyes roll in my head, but um, but it seems to me that I think there are two actually really different, interesting points being made in the paper, right? One is around this idea that the pitch is not just a communication mechanism, it's a learning mechanism, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, I, I mean, I, and I think, I think we all sort of, at some level, we understand that, but I think it's great to see that. So I really in, enjoyed that. But, and then there's kind of the process to which the pitch helps you to learn. And that process struck me as being a fairly straightforward sort of learning, fairly general learning process, right? So it wasn't entirely clear to me why that learning process was specific to the pitch or whether that learning process was different from any other learning process for an entrepreneur you would expect, right? So, so I guess the implication is either I would want to see, is there something about learning through pitches that is different from learning from, suppose they weren't pitching, suppose they were just, you know, putting out a business plan or they were just actually experimenting with this stuff and right. So what is it about, like you could learn by borrowing, you could learn by doing, you could learn by thinking all of those things happen outside of pitches as well, right? So is there some mix of these things that is different about learning from pitching? So is learning from pitching fundamentally different from learning from whatever the alternative is, right? And I think part of it is I'm not sure what the alternative is, but whatever that alternative is. Uh, or is the story more about saying, look, you learn in exactly the same way that you would learn from, from something else, but the pitch is the sort of boundary object that allows you to do that, right? Those are two different stories in my mind, right? And I, it would be interesting to see, and maybe both are true, right? So I think some of Vilena's comments around the two different types of landscapes and the two different processes of sort of logic versus cognition, right? So I could imagine saying, hey, we're not trying to learn what the best strategy is. We're trying to satisfy and figure out what strategy will sound plausible to our mentors. And once we figure that out, we're good. We don't need actual logic, right? Like people believe our story, we're, we're fine, right? So this is really experimenting with believability as opposed to experimenting with logic. That might be a big difference about learning from pitches versus learning from you know, uh, experience or learning in other ways. Um, but I, I think either it needs to be a story about here's how this kind of learning is different if you are going to lay out this process or, or it could be a story about saying, actually, it's not different at all, but the pitch is the way you do this. And isn't that interesting, right? Which I think it is interesting. So again, I, I think both those stories work for me, but I think they're different. Yeah, thank you. Um, I appreciate those comments and I, I, I see how at some at one level, it looks like any other learning process, but at another level, so if we look at learning through a minimum viable product, for example, so uh, it, which is done quite often in entrepreneurship, that is really just looking at one specific part of the firm. It's looking at the firm's value proposition and its customer acquisition strategy and channels, but it's rarely looking at the big picture. So one of the advantages of learning through pitching is not just looking at how each, not just solving for each one of these, these little problems, right? So not each, each piece of the business, but it really succinctly brings together the entire business and the entire business model. And it shows you how these different pieces may or may not fit together. And so there's instances where um, through their learning, to, through, through putting together the pitch, they, these entrepreneurs start to realize they're not going to make money, right? So they put together their pitch, they put together their financial model. So it, it's very, it is similar to putting together the business model canvas can have a lot of, of you know, similar 
um, similar effects, and I would say might be similar in, in many different ways, but by putting the narrative together very succinctly into you know, a, a couple minutes, they're able to see how these things fit together and right. more importantly, where they don't fit together. And that creates this so, domino effect where, you know, okay, so if we change this one thing, then we're going to have to change all these other things. Um, and so, so I think that the narrative do a better job of bringing together past, future, and then ongoing into an ongoing present, and also do a better, better job of bringing together these disparate pieces and seeing how they um, how they align or not than say in any other type of learning cycle. So I, I like that, but again, notice that everything you just said is not about the process of learning, it's about what you're learning about, right? So it's this architectural sort of, or to use Violina's term, Gestalt learning rather than component learning. I mean, I would call it architectural versus component. Violina would call it Gestalt. Right? I'm not that German, but you know, like, but, but, but the, but that's not really a difference in the process of learning. It's a difference in what you are learning about, right? So again, I, 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 I like that, but I think pointing that out would be, right? And I mean, I think somewhere in the, in the presentation, you made the point that there's a lot more flexibility to sort of experiment more broadly with stuff because you can change the words on the, on the page, on the slide faster than you can whip up a new product, right? So again, there may be more variation. Like again, my evolutionary hat on, there's more variation. And so you can kind of get, right? So that, that's all, I mean, again, I think there's a lot, I do think there's, I'm not saying, I don't think pitches are any different. I think they are different, but I think pointing out how they are different is to me what is really valuable here. Uh, and, and I'm not convinced for what it's worth, I'm not convinced that the actual processes are the source of difference. I think it's how you, like, it's what you're learning about that's different. That's really helpful, Asim. Thank you very much. I need to give this some more thought, and but it's a really good line of questioning and I really like your insight about it. Thank you. Awesome. So I think we're at the end. Um, and I hopefully, uh, Susan, you'd be okay with anyone contacting you if they have any other questions or comments. Of course. Um, that was amazing. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you so much, Violina and Robin and Colleen for helping to organize. Um, and next week, we